All right, so tonight we're going to cover Parashat Bayakhel. As you recall, I named the series Important Lessons and Moral Teachings of the Parashat. Some people may think that Bayakhel and perhaps Pekudei may not have so many lessons, but you will be surprised. There are lessons to be learned from every single word in the Torah, every single parasha. Valuable lessons if we actually studied the text a little bit more in depth. Some of you may recall a famous saying attributed to the Baal Shem Tov. A man is where his thoughts are. What does that mean? That whatever one thinks says a lot about him. Because where his thoughts are, that's where he is. Well, if that's the case, if we want to bring about some change in an individual, if we want to bring about some change in a person's life, the first step, the first place to change is the thoughts, because that's where the man is. So my question on that is, why should the thought be so important? After all, when we think about thoughts, what comes to mind is imagination. What is a thought? An action is something serious. Speech is also something serious, but a thought, even though we know that everything begins in the thought, but why should we attribute so much importance to a thought? It's after all, still in imagination. So the author of the Chovat Levavot, a very important book, says as follows, that the main power the human being has is in his ratzon, in his will. Because what actually happens to him in life, whether he succeeds or fails, whether his plans carry out, that is not completely up to him. Where is his power, his strength? Where is it most noticeable? The koach ratzon, in his will if he has the will or not. That is the source of his strength. If that's the case, one can deduce from this that the, that ratzon, that will that he's talking about, where is it developed? In the machshava. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. That willpower, that ratzon, that desire that an individual has, has to come from somewhere. So it sprang up in the machshava. So it all began in the thought. That's where it was seeded. That where it was, that's where it was planted. And it developed. According to Rav Nachman of Breslav, he takes it one step further. And wherever your thoughts are, that's where you want to be. Well, let's just say perhaps some of the time, not necessarily all the time that you want to be where your thoughts are, but it says a lot about the person. What the Baal Shem Tov and Rav Nachman and Vesav are saying is the thoughts tell us a lot about the person. If that's the case, what do we deduce from this? That the main driving force or what motivates us to do certain things are the thoughts. That's where everything begins. The problem is that there are some sublime thoughts, lofty thoughts, good thoughts, positive thoughts, and there are some that are very, very lowly and negative. Different kinds of thoughts. And if you ever read a little bit about what Freud investigated and what Nietzsche, these individuals were great, uh, I guess you can call them psychoanalysts, who analyzed the human being, human behavior. Psychologists. And each one of them they were not the only ones, but these are the ones that are more known to people. Each one of them figured on something else that is driving the human being. What is the main driving force motivating the human being? And Freud said, it is the will to pleasure. Man wants to have pleasure, he wants to feel good. Whereas Nietzsche concluded that it's the will to power. All right. Now, there's something to each one of them you should know. There's some truth to what each one of them says. 
But is that conclusive? No, not necessarily, because they couldn't go too far and too deep into the human psyche because they don't have knowledge that the Torah shares with us, that the Kabbalah teaches us. So there was only so much they can do through their own investigation, through their own analysis, through their own limited minds. And as smart as they were, that's all that they understood. Even though, of course, they went on to investigate other behavioral patterns and the like. But when it comes to what motivates man, what's the main driving force that's getting him to do certain things, each one gave a different idea either the will to pleasure or the will to power. What are they missing? What they're missing is that it all depends what we're talking about. Is it the neshama or the nefesh abeimi? Is it the soul or the animal spirit? You see, what happens is, if you're dealing with the animal spirit, you can make that claim. Pleasure, power, it's fits in perfectly, very compatible, it makes some sense that at least that is involved. That is one of the powers that's driving people to do certain things. But the neshama has no interest in that, and we know from our tradition that we have a soul. So there, there's something else that's motivating the human being who has both an animal spirit and a soul. So if we have the two, we may have something else that's driving us some of the time at least depending on which of the two is more powerful, which of the two is in charge, that will determine which one is the more important driving force behind our actions. On top of that, let's not forget that what makes up the human character is his masal, his education, his upbringing, the society he lives in, the teachers he has, a lot of that molds his character, his personality, his views and the like. All of that too. But once a person has received his education, has gone through school and is already an adult, the thoughts that he has now, what they produce are a outlook or a perspective about life. So it's no longer just thoughts, plain thoughts. This man or woman has matured, has received what hopefully by then is a good education and a good upbringing. But with all that, they will have formed a certain outlook, certain attitudes, certain priorities, values, interests, and the like. So it's not just thoughts, they're actually formed and tell us a lot more now about the person than we could have known when he was a young child. Where the mind was just a sponge absorbing all of that information and developing it. But with time, what we see is that these thoughts that everyone has from the early on develop further and they are the ones that form our goals and aspirations and our priorities and, and the like. Now we can understand a little bit why we have Republicans and Democrats, if you ever wondered. Why doesn't everybody think alike? And the rabbis tell us it's not going to be, it's never going to be like that, that people are going to think alike because in the same way that people's face is different, people don't look alike, their mindset, the way they think, is very, very different. People share certain values in common, people think alike, of course, but in the end what happens is, is as a result of all that I just mentioned, you're going to have different priorities, different thoughts, different likes and dislikes, different outlook, and different priorities. So priorities is what it's all about. One party will emphasize certain things that are important to them, and another party will emphasize what is important to it. Does everybody in that party have the same priorities? No, not necessarily, but they are somewhat similar. So they join the same party, but they will not necessarily think alike exactly the same. So what we have so far as 
completely different attitudes perhaps or outlook about life which in the end can make a big difference as to our decisions what we value what we consider important the best way perhaps to look at it is through an example with tzedakah I'm going to give you an example that the rabbis teach us where you can see people's different outlook attitude you can see how people handle a simple relatively simple concept or mitzvah called tzedakah, charity. You may recall from Pirkei Avot, there are four individuals, even though there's more, but four basic individuals. Number one, he wishes to give tzedakah, and he wishes others not to give tzedakah. You know what, he wants to do the mitzvah himself. Very nice. Or is it not too nice? Not too nice. Nah, it doesn't look like this guy is really interested so much in tzedakah because why be the only one to give? If you think tzedakah is that important, let everyone else share too. But this guy wants to give it, no one else should give. All right, it exists. This type of individual exists. Individual number two, he wants everybody else to give and he doesn't want to give. Also not too good. He's being cheap. Stingy. You want everybody else to give? Well, at least. He doesn't mind everybody else giving. But it's incomplete. Then you have number three. He doesn't want to give and he doesn't want anybody else to give either. He's a rasha. That type of outlook, that type of characteristic is evil. Has no interest in helping, has, doesn't care, not sensitive. Now we're talking about someone who acts like this just about all the time. Not that he has a problem with a cause. In general, that is his attitude. He doesn't believe in tzedakah. He has his own philosophy perhaps about life. This is very bad. It's negative. And then you have number four. He wants to give and he wants others to give. That is a good person. That is a righteous individual. He has a positive attitude. He has the right outlook at least this is what the Torah says that we should do. We should not only ourselves be kind and generous to others, but we should want other people to be generous as well. Now, within these individuals, there are additional individuals because there's different levels of how charitable a person can be. And when you learn the halachot of tzedakah, you will see that there is an individual, for example, that doesn't wait for the poor man to approach him, he goes looking for the poor man to give tzedakah. Wouldn't you agree that that is much more uh, generous and uh, kind and sensitive than someone who just waits? And if somebody comes knocking on the door, he opens the door. There's obviously a difference here too. So you see that e even within those that are generous, kind and charitable, you will still find minute differences in how they look at this mitzvah. As an example, what their attitude is, why would they want to do something like this? What's burning in them? Why don't you just wait? You have to go look for this individual. Obviously, his outlook is somewhat different. He understands the value of this mitzvah. All right, now, my question to you, is it possible then for someone who is stingy by nature, who has that kind of an, of an outlook, an attitude, to ever become a generous person. It's possible for him to train himself to get used to... Is it easy? No. But it's possible? We're told yes. How do we know that? So, the Sefer HaChinuch, a very important book that talks a little bit about the Mitzvot, an explanation, about every mitzvah says that achrei ha-peulot nimshachot ha-levavot that one's heart is affected or influenced by one's peulot the actions that one does the more that one does certain things the more it will inspire him influence him in other words peulot are important because the levavot, the hearts will be influenced by them now, they could be peulot that are not good. They could be actions that are not good. Imagine people who were guards in Auschwitz. And their peulot, I don't have to explain, were, 
were very sadistic, very cruel. What would you expect them to be like after the war is over? When they were involved in certain kinds of perulot, certain kinds of actions that are sadistic and cruel in nature. Well, the other way around, if somebody is involved in helping people in charitable work, hopefully after time, this perulot will influence his heart, will affect him. So this is an important rule. And therefore, it is possible not to uproot our nature, the rabbis tell us, but it is possible to adopt habits that will form a second nature where certain things will become easier for us to do. We may at first think, oh, this is impossible, this is too difficult for me to do. No, as we say in Hebrew, you have that ratzon that we mentioned earlier, you have that will, you really want it, you can get there, depending of course what it is. People may have the will or the desire to make a million dollars, they're not necessarily going to get their hands on a million dollars, because that's something that relates to mazal. Here we're talking about attitude, we're talking about perspective and outlook, we're talking about behavior, nidot, character. So even though a person is born with certain predisposition to be more stingy, he is able to moderate it, he is able to make some changes depending on what his peulot will be. So peulot actions can definitely make a difference. They will eventually determine what we will be. All right, so all of this was just a brief introduction to Pashat Bayakil. What does it have to do with Vayakhel, you may ask? Well, in Vayakhel, in Parashat Vayakhel, we find certain perulot. We find certain actions that are taken by the Jews. What kind of an action? A very, very unique action that everyone is asked to contribute towards the building of the Mishkan and the Kelim, all the vessels, as much as they want. It is no longer a set amount, machzita shekel, a half a shekel, on two occasions they were asked to contribute a half a shekel, that's it. It's going to go for a certain purpose. But for the building of the Mishkan, each one bring whatever material you have that can be helpful in building the Mishkan, and you can bring kol isha sheyedevenu libo. So those words are key here to understanding what is going on in this parasha. They're given an opportunity, bring as much as you want. Wow. Let's see. Let's see how generous you are. Let's see if you will open up your heart, how much you will open up. So you can imagine, there were different people. Not everybody was the same. Some brought more, some brought less. But at least it gave them an opportunity without being told how much. Let's see how much you can do on your own. So by involving them and by giving this chance for them, it helped develop that nida of nedivut, of generosity which we'll talk a little bit about later on, why it was so important. But at the very least, we can now understand that this is an important perula. Get everybody involved in contributing. And don't tell them how much. Let it come naturally from them. All right. But why does Moshe have to gather them all? He says, Vayakhel. That's how the parasha begins. He gathered them all. You don't see that in too many places. He basically speaks to them, instructs them, tells them, I was told by God, this is what you need to do. Here it says, Vayakhel. He actually gathered them. This is also a very valuable lesson. What is Moshe telling them? Don't come up with any excuses that you are not in the mood, that you're tired, that you don't want to do it. Because I recall I was told when I was not around that you gathered to make that egil, that golden calf. Somehow you had the energy, somehow you were not tired to do that. Full force, you went and were motivated somehow to make that golden calf. Therefore, what I'm asking of you is show that same determination, that same excitement, and gather together to make this Mishkan. Why is it so necessary? It's not only an atonement. As the rabbis tell us, it was an atonement. You've invested so much in making the golden calf, now invest of yourself in making this mishkan. It's much more than just an atonement. Eliyahu Navi, there's a story, once met a fisherman. And the fisherman was not a very learned person. And uh, he gets into a conversation with him, tell me, 
what do you do for a living? He says, I catch fish. He says, how do you catch fish? He says, I make nets and I catch the fish. How do you make nets? Well, I grow the flax and I cut the flax and I put together a elaborate net which serves me very well for catching the fish. He says, tell me, do you learn any Torah? At all? Or is that all you do is catch fish a whole day? So he tells him, I don't have a head for Torah. I'm not so intelligent to learn Torah. He says, really? But you're intelligent enough to make a net, to grow the flax, to put it together into to making a net so that you can catch. For that you do have intelligence, right? For Torah you don't? That's an excuse. People have a lot of excuses for not doing what is really important and what they really are capable of doing. Chafetz Chaim once commented to a very wealthy individual, tell me how much tzedakah do you give a year? He says, I give so much, which was very little compared to what he really could. He says, but tell me, how come you, you bought expensive silk curtains, silk curtains, very expensive curtains, for that you have money and not for tzedakah? Anything you say about giving tzedakah that you don't have or that you can't give more, is all an excuse because I see that you can give more because you've given more, you've spent more on other things that you care more about apparently. Why do you care more about that and about this? There's something wrong here. So we see from this that the human being does have sometimes the power. He does have the money. He does have the intelligence to apply it properly. But he may not want to for some reason. And he comes up with some excuse. Because he's going to use that power, that money, that time that he has for silly things, for nonsense. Why are you using it for that and not for this? So here Moshe says, you've gathered for making the golden calf. I know that you can gather and you have the energy, hopefully the excitement, the interest to make the Mishkan. So what happens in real life is people, because they have more of an interest in themselves, there, it's easier for them to spend on themselves than to spend on others. They see themselves, they don't see other people. This helps understand why many people get divorced. If you ever wondered, people get divorced for all kinds of reasons, but there's a common denominator, is many, many times one of the two, or the two of them, they only see themselves. They don't see the couple, they don't see the family, their children, they're seeing themselves. And if they're focused only on themselves, then obviously it will be much more difficult for them to share, to compromise, to give in. And they get divorced, they split. They are seeing themselves, they're focused and centered on themselves. So what is exactly happening with these people? It's their thoughts, their will, their priorities, everything that we just mentioned before, being focused on themselves. I'll give, you, I'll give you perhaps another small example where you can see this point. There was once a great rabbi, this is before World War II. He was in Germany and he saw a German, non-Jew, kissing his dog in a very passionate way. And he was very, very shocked to see something like this. You know, people are very affectionate, a little bit fine. But he was dealing with his dog, or treating it like, he, like the dog was his girlfriend <laughs> or something. You know? Very, very strange. And he said to himself, a people that can be so passionate about an animal, so passionate about one of these days they're going to be murderers and, and kill human beings. Why? What does one thing have to do with another? Because that interest, that caring, that passion really needs to be focused on human beings, not on animals. It's just, it's, it's distorted view. There's nothing wrong with caring for an animal. Being sensitive, the rabbis tell us you cannot inflict pain on an animal. You, have, you, know, you need to take care of it, especially if it's yours. There's no doubt about that, but it's disproportionate in that case. In that example, it was a disproportionate passion for an animal where he already felt and he didn't know what was going to happen. This is before World War II. 
that somebody who's capable of so, showing such extreme disproportionate passion for an animal will be capable one day of murdering human beings because his priorities are all mixed up. It's a distorted view of what he should really care for. So the question is, the why did he do it? Why is it what really a distorted view? So it comes down to what we just finished saying. This dog, this animal, brings him pleasure. That's all. So it's what's in it for him. He is focused on himself. He doesn't see the bigger picture. He doesn't see humanity, life's purpose. This is what brings him pleasure. And by the way, you know, you know why dogs make good friends and good pets? They're not very demanding. Marriage is more demanding. <laughs> a dog, a pet, a bird, a fish, they're not so demanding. And a dog is man's best friend. A lot of people love dogs, especially cute dogs, you know? Why not? They're not demanding and they're nice. Doesn't take too much. And people, therefore, are more focused on that which brings them pleasure. And especially if it's not too difficult to deal with. So, the bottom line here is, it's a completely distorted view of where one's interest should really, really be. All right. What does this all tell us? That man really does have the capability, if he wants to, if he's trained properly, to be motivated for the right things. Because naturally, we're motivated for, for the things that we like. But we, we do have that same motivation, that same power that motivates us to go after that which we like. That same power can be used to motivate ourselves to do other things as well. So the energy that we have, the drive that we have to pursue certain things that may not be right, is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that energy. It's just, it all depends how we channel it. How do we direct it? For example, you may have heard of people who are ascetic, ascetism. They deprive themselves of all the pleasures in the world. They don't want to have anything to do with this world. They meditate a whole day. Ascetic lifestyle. The Torah is against this. The Torah does not believe that it's a healthy thing to do. Besides the fact that it's wrong, it's not a healthy thing to do because the human being was created with certain instincts and drives. You can't suppress them. It's not right. It's not healthy to suppress them. You have to just have self-restraint, self-control, and you have to know how to channel the drive that you have and elevate it in a holy way. So the drive that we have, the energy that we have, is not bad. It's good. It all depends how you use it, how you channel it. Are you going to elevate it? How, how are you going to eat? To fill your stomach like a glutton? Or just to be healthy? You know, what's the main purpose of why you're eating? So people have different reasons of why they want to eat. What is driving you? You live to eat or you just eat so that you can live? <laughs> it all depends on your, what's motivating you. So what Hashem gave us, what we have by nature is important, but we have to know how to channel it properly because it is powerful. It could be used for the right things, it could be used for the wrong things. So the Torah, through the various mitzvot, teaches us, Kedoshim to you, elevate yourself. Elevate what you have that is permissible. It's permissible to eat kosher food, yeah, but you can eat like a glutton, and that's not being holy. That's being like an animal. So there are certain things that you can do. Get married, for sure. Don't deprive yourself. In other words, don't deprive yourself and separate yourself from this world. You're here for a certain purpose. You were given certain capabilities. You have certain drives. Just use them in the right way, in a holy way. Get married and have children, have a family. Eat so that you be healthy. Sleep so that you have a good night's sleep and wake up the next day to be able to go to pray and so forth. So do things for the right reason, not suppress them. 
when I have nothing to do with them. So what is required in order to use them properly is lekadeshotam, is to elevate them and to sanctify them. So in Parshat Vayakhel, the emphasis is take all that energy that you have, the material that you have, and invest it in building of the Mishkan. Even though we already have been introduced to the building of the Mishkan, there is more emphasis now in Parshat Vayakhel and Pekude as well, as to taking all that energy that we have and in a generous way contributing towards the Mishkan. But why the Mishkan? For several reasons. Reason number one, what we just finished saying, invest your energy in something holy. Why? Because what you're going to invest your time and energy is going to affect you. It's going to make you a different person. You're doing something that is elevated, it's going to elevate you. Plus, it's going to keep you out of trouble. The Rambam says that some people have a hard time with having dirty thoughts. They have dirty thoughts, immoral thoughts. It says those kinds of thoughts affect people whose mind is not preoccupied in the study of Torah. People's mind will be preoccupied in the study of Torah and not just empty they wouldn't have these thoughts invading their mind. A mind is invaded because it's empty. Like the rabbis tell us about mice. The rabbis tell us the hole invites the mouse or the rat. It's not that the rat is trying to get in. If there's a hole, that's where it's going to go. So don't leave a hole. Seal the hole so the mouse doesn't enter. Because it is the pirza. It is the pirza, something that is broken or an open gate that invites the thief. They don't want to work too hard. Wherever it's easier, they're going to enter. So what's going to enter the mind? Well, it depends. If the mind is already full of good thoughts of Torah, it doesn't have so much of a... There's not so much of an opening anymore to, an, to allow anything else to enter. Somebody's mind, therefore, that is being invaded with bad thoughts is indicative that his mind is panui mina chokhmah. It is vacant from any intelligence or from any Torah. So here, involve them, preoccupy them with something practical, with something productive. The building of the Mishkan. Get them all together on this important project it will make sure that they stay away from trouble. It will be also an atonement for the sin, for the golden calf. That was also part of the reason. And it's going to teach them along the way important values in life. All of this through involvement in the building of the Mishkan. How is this an atonement for the golden calf? So I was thinking, the rabbis tell us, that if an individual is very depressed, he's very sad, feels terrible about himself that so many years went to waste because he did the wrong things. He did many avarot, committed many sins. What should he do? Just ask forgiveness? So the rabbi tells, besides asking forgiveness, If you've committed a lot of wrongs and you made bundles of sins, then now, for the rest of your life. Make bundles of mitzvot, of good deeds. You hurt people, so now go ahead and help people. There's always a way to fix certain things that may not have been done right. As long as a person still is healthy and he has years, a few more years to live, he can accomplish a lot. So here is an opportunity. Moshe is telling him, you're going to gather now and build this Mishkan because you've gathered for the wrong things. You put your time and energy and money into the wrong things, the you know, golden calf. All right, you made a mistake. Now go ahead and put all that time, money, and effort in building a Mishkan for Hashem. Use it for the right thing. And you have the ability, as we said before, you demonstrated that ability for the wrong things. You for sure can demonstrate it for the right things. So this gives them an opportunity to atone as well for the sin of the golden calf. One of the most unfortunate and sad things in life <laughs> It's, I don't know if to cry or to laugh, it's, it's, but it's, you, you, I'm sure you know about it, you've seen it or have heard about it, is when a couple gets divorced, 
that's bad enough. What makes it worse is that they spend millions of dollars on attorney fees to get that divorce. I remember a case that I was told from the early 70s, I think it was, here in Los Angeles. I'm not going to mention names. Very wealthy couple that was getting divorced. And back then, we're talking about the early 70s, they had already spent $35 million, I think. A lot of money. I don't remember how much it was. Millions of dollars on attorney fees. Because obviously there was a lot of uh, assets. And you know what the judge said? Isn't that enough, what you've spent? The judge had to tell him, isn't that enough? People don't realize that the lawyers which not, do not always have your best interest in mind, by the way, unfortunately, are not going to stop. They wanna, they're going to try to milk you of as much money, especially if they see that you have it, so they can, you know, enrich themselves. So, look, people are willing to spend so much money. But why? We'll answer it in a moment. Let's use another example on a brighter note. People getting married, not divorced, and spending $50,000 just on flowers that are going to go to the garbage in a day or two. I'm sure you've seen this, as they're called in Hebrew, chatunot pe'er, of tremendous luxury, fancy weddings. What for? For a couple hours to eat? This couple could use the money perhaps to buy a house, especially if you can't afford it. I mean, if the guy is a multimillionaire, he's entitled to spend a little bit more. He's entitled to have more guests, of course, because he has the money. I'm talking about the people that don't have it, the people that have to borrow that money. As they say in English, to keep up with the Jones, something like that, yeah. Well, what for? To show off? A lot of times what the Ratzon here is, we talked about the Ratzon, the will, what's behind this? Rasot Roshem is to make an impression. It, what should have been the Ratzon? Let's make people happy. Let's help people. Let's be kind to people. Let's improve people's lives. Imagine if today the superpowers decide, okay, we're going to make a new treaty. What's a new treaty? No more missiles. We're not going to spend any more min money on missiles. Instead, we're going to take all that money and help all the poor people, all the orphans, all the needy in the world. Huh? Then Mashiach is here already. How do we know Mashiach would have come then? Because that's the sign that Mashiach has come, because that's what they're going to do then. Why the, by, by, wait till then? Do it now. They're, they're not thinking like that. And I'm always bothered by it. Why can't they think that way? Because they're thinking about themselves. It's either power, it's power, like we said before, or pleasure, or something similar to that. So, of course they try to help here and there, but that's not their main goal. So where is their ratzon? Where is their will? Where is their interest? Where are their priorities? So that should really be what motivates people. The desire, the interest to help, and not to do something just for impression, to show off. That, these are things that are not right to do. But people, because of pressures of all kinds, or because they were brought up like that, they think that this is something worthy, and it's not. It's, it's ugly. Everybody agrees that unity is something very special, right? Achdut. Unity is beautiful. Do you know why it doesn't always work? Because the ratzon ha'ishi mit arev po. It's the personal interest, the personal desires that gets in the way. Usually, that's the main cause of why people do not get along. There's some personal interest involved. Why is that personal interest causing problems? We're going to get to momentarily. But that is what usually causes all the issues that couples have and nations have, some personal interest that gets in the way. Otherwise, everybody agrees, unity is great. Why can't we all be together? Even though we have different views, but why can't we cooperate and be united? There's something that gets in the way, the personal interest. This personal interest, by the way, 
as difficult as it is and as much trouble that it causes, is really why a Baal Teshuvah is held in so, so much high regard. Baal Teshuvah is one who has changed his lifestyle, he has repented and decided to become more observant. He's held in high regard. Rabbis tell us, that in the place in heaven where the, these people are, those who have repented and changed their lifestyle, even the, the righteous cannot catch up with them. They are in a higher level. Why? You know what this Baal Teshuvah did? He had a certain lifestyle that was wrong. He may have been a criminal. And what he has done is that personal desire, personal interest that he had of leading a certain life, a certain way, he gave it up to do whose will? The will of Hashem. So he pushed his will aside to push to do the will of Hashem. As opposed to Tzadikim, righteous people, they're, they're great. But they never had to push aside. They grew up in Gadluim they were always like that. They were good. They were good people. That's they were trained. They have their own challenges too, of course. They never had to push aside. You know what this guy just did? He took that personal interest that he had, that desire, that, that lifestyle, and he pushed it aside. I'm doing now for Hashem. I'm doing Hashem's will, not my will. Wow, that's admirable. That is why they are on a higher level than an ordinary, an ordinary tzaddik that has always been doing the right thing. What they've done is self-sacrifice. It's not easy to become a real Baal Teshuvah like that where you push away, especially if you're already older and you've gotten used to a certain lifestyle. Not easy at all. People who have been making millions of dollars, they dropped everything. They dropped their careers if it interfered with their Shabbat. They decided, I'm now keeping Shabbat. But you're playing soccer. I mean, there are stories like that, or basketball. How could you, how could you be willing to forfeit a $25 million contract, whatever it may be, just because of that one day? If I have to play on that day, then I'm not going to play. That's tremendous strength, willpower. Again, it goes back to that willpower, the ratzon, if you really want something. And obviously, you have to be 100% sincere about it. You can't just say, no, oh, I'd love it, no. But when we talk about Ratzon, we mean real Ratzon. You're going to go after it. You're going to try your best to reach that level. And when the Baal Teshuvah does reach that level, he has demonstrated something very, very special. It's a great achievement, it's a great feat, which is what makes him on a higher level than the regular tzaddik. Which is why the rabbis, by the way, tell us, that is why Teshuvah Repentance is something so great that it reaches till the throne, till God's throne. You know, was, even though this guy may have been a terrible individual, but if he's really done Teshuvah and he's made the U-turn, it, it reaches the throne of Hashem. Hashem accepts him because Hashem knows how difficult it is. So regardless of what he has done, even though, of course, everyone has to pay for his crimes and everybody needs an atonement of sorts, it may be a reincarnation, it may be something else, but at least Hashem has accepted him and embraced him. I accept you, you are my child now. I welcome you. Even though it's so late, even though you've done such terrible things, I admire you, I'm proud of you. Because this is a real achievement. Rabbis tell us, for example, that if a person did not work on at least refining one characteristic, then he hasn't achieved anything because this is what it really, this is what is really considered as an achievement. One who has worked on his character, has refined it, has become a better person. In Parshat Vayakhel, you will find a very interesting donation, a very interesting contribution. The women contributed mirrors. Do you recall that? Mm -hmm. To the kior, to making the wash basin. All right, the women we know are, were involved in the making of the mishkan. But mirrors, Moshe Rabbeinu had a problem with. I don't want to take those mirrors. Mirrors, mirrors is not something nice to use for something holy. What does a woman do with a mirror? She looks at it. She wants to beautify herself and put on makeup, and it's not something that really belongs in the kior. Makes sense, doesn't it? 
Moshe had a good point. And what does Hashem tell him? No, 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 you don't understand. Dafka, I want those mirrors. Not just any mirror, those mirrors. Why? So the Midrash tells us that it was in Egypt that the men had been discouraged from procreating. Why should we procreate? Our kids are thrown into the Nile. They're killed. Or if they grow up, they become slaves. Why procreate? So it was the women through the mirrors that made themselves look good in the eyes of their husband that somehow convinced their husbands to continue to have a family. So those mirrors are holy, aren't they? Because they were used for a holy purpose, not just for themselves. They didn't think of just themselves, beautify themselves. Here it was used in a positive way. If that's the case, those mirrors belong in the Mishkan. They are holy. They have been elevated. Something which is physical, material, has been elevated because it was used in a proper way. They therefore belong in the Mishkan as part of the wash basin. And what would happen with that wash basin? The priests would wash their hands and feet from it. And by seeing those mirrors, perhaps they would be reminded, yeah, the ultimate goal of washing myself is not just to have clean feet. What am I washing my hands and feet for? So that I can do the job properly. This is a holy job. I need to therefore be clean. I need to sanctify myself and not just do it without being ready for it. So here they're being reminded by those same mirrors that were elevated and used for a good cause. The Kohanim now are being reminded of their service. What, what we see from all of this is just a few examples of how one can use that which is physical and elevate it. As I may have told you once, there was a guy who came to ask for a blessing from the rabbi. Rabbi, I want you to give me a, a blessing. What kind of a blessing do you need? That I should uh, succeed in buying a new car. He says, you should be ashamed of yourself. If that's what you need a blessing for, to buy a new car. He says, but Rabbi, every time I go from Yerushalayim to Bnei Brak, I need a ten trempim. I give a lift, right? Is that how you say it? Yes, give a ride. I give a ride to people on the way. Every single time people, you know, they stand. Oh, you're using it for a mitzvah, the car. If that's the case, I give you a berakha. <laughs> so the car is for a mitzvah. It's not just for himself. He's using it for something good. Then it's okay. Then it's worth it. <laughs> what do we see from all of this? That the more the kavanah, the more the intent is good and pure, then the machshava, the thoughts, will become good too which is what we started talking about, how everything begins with the machshava. But the machshavot, the thoughts may not be so good. Okay, but with time, your kavanot, your intent, your peulot, your actions, what you do, will hopefully be able to modify those machshavot because that is the key. You want to change a person, you need to change his machshavot. That's, if you don't change his thoughts and his mindset, his outlook, how are you going to change him? You want him to value other things, you want him to have different priorities, you've got to work on changing his thoughts. And how is that going to happen? <laughs> you just can't give him a class. He has to see it. Shabbat, for example, has to be experienced. People don't know what Shabbat is unless they experience it. And that is what we said earlier, that the peulot, the actions that we fulfill, help us because they are the ones that hopefully will influence our heart to become more charitable, to become kinder, and more sensitive to people. Which is why the Torah puts an emphasis on Zahav Tahor. A lot of the Kilim, if you notice, a lot of the vessels were made out of pure gold. Now even though there may be other explanations, what, what, what is gold according to the Kabbalah? What does it represent? We know it's something precious, that's simple, that's obvious. But it, it tells us that it has to be pure gold. Don't mix anything else. The purity is the key to understanding here, what, what, the, what the Torah is teaching us. You, ha you have to be pure. You can't be two-faced. You have to be sincere. You care about something, you have to care about it all the way. So going back to what we said earlier with the tzedakah. You care about tzedakah, then you have to want others to give too. Otherwise, it's not pure. It's not 
there's a lot of fake in this world, and you're hearing it in the news, fake news, a lot of fake. Now, our tradition is that before Mashiach comes, the sheker, that which is false, will be king. There will be a, a lot more sheker than ever before, a lot more falsehood. And unfortunately, as a result of that, it's very difficult to ascertain what is true and what is not true, because everybody's into this. A lot of people are into that which is fake. Even jewelry is fake these days. Things are imitated in China. It looks like a Rolex, but it's not a real Rolex, not a real watch. You know, diamonds, a lot of fake diamonds, huh? Fake emeralds too? Yes. Really? Oh, wow. A lot of fakes, everything is fake. Now, what does that do to people? When people are not real, when they're fake, when their midot are no good, this is what brings about rifts and problems between people because people who are real, people who are pure, it is easy, it is much easier for them to keep their distance from those that are not real and fake. It is much easier for them to focus on what they need to do. They don't get mixed up because they are real. People who are fake, people who are not pure, are not real people, they're going to have trouble with people all the time because they're not sincere. They try to smile at you because they want to be your friend, but they don't really like you. You can't live like that. If you don't like an individual, if you can't get along with him, obviously you have to behave yourself, you have to treat everybody respectfully, but be yourself and tell them honestly, we're different, we shared nothing in common perhaps, and that's it. People get confused when they're not real because they're trying to have the cake and eat it too. They're trying to play both sides of the game. They, try, they want to be Jewish and, and observant perhaps part of the time, but not all the time. That gets them into trouble with Hashem. The people get into trouble with other human beings as well. It's a, all as a result of being fake. Being real, therefore, is the key over here that the Torah is telling us to develop by telling us, you see, this kelim are zahav tahor, they're pure gold, this is the way you need to be. Strive to be pure, strive to be a real person. Otherwise, divisions, machloket, arguments, conflicts will always persist everywhere because of this lack of realness because of this fake being the more dominant characteristic than the one than the real people who are truthful and real don't have as much problem than the ones who are not real there would not be any machloket or at least not so much machloket an argument if people were truthful were 100 percent pure what can we do it's it, it's it's the fake and bad midot that contribute to most of the problems that people have. If people's midot were much better, were pure, if they were nice, if they were kind and generous, they would have, people will take advantage of them perhaps. That, yes, that can happen, but usually these people suffer less. They're complete with themselves. They're, they, are, they, they understand that this is the right way, and they have to learn how to deal with people who are not like them. It's not easy. There's a lot of people who are very nice and good who have to deal with family members who are totally not like them. It's a struggle. But it doesn't mean that you should give up and, and be like them. If anything, try to help them be a better person. What I'm trying to say over here is it's the midot. It's, in the end, it's all about midot character that either brings people together or makes them stay apart from each other. So, once we know that it's the midot, which is, you think, the more important midah that will help, the more important characteristics that will help people develop a better relationship with each other? Since midot is, uh, is what we're talking about, it's nedivut, it's generosity and kindness, which is why, as we started to, to talk about the parasha, this is the midah that is being stressed. Kol isha shi deven olibo, be generous. Give as much as you can. Why? Because this is the midah that the rabbis call Ein Tova. There's an evil eye. What's the opposite of an evil eye? A good eye, a generous eye. An eye that is content with what they have and never jealous, never coveting for more. And a, a good eye that 
is happy for other people who are successful. A lot of people are not happy that other people have made it and are successful. They have tsarut ayin. They're narrow eyes, evil eyes. They're negative people. Be happy for others. Be content with what you have. Have a positive outlook. That's all called ayin tova. This is what helps people be generous. You want to therefore train yourself to be generous? It's possible. Train yourself to have a good eye. This, of course, requires work. It's not easy, but that's what the Mishkan did in part, is bring them all together to develop that trait of generosity and of kindness by giving as much as you can. As a result of that, what happened? That beautiful Mishkan was never destroyed. Rabbi tells us the Mishkan Nignaz, it was interred. Why? It was built through the generosity of the Jewish people. The first temple and the second temple were destroyed. Unfortunately, the third one, Bezat Hashem, will stay forever. Mm -hmm. But the Mishkan was interred. What merit did the Mishkan have to be interred and never be destroyed? Because it was built with generosity. The Jewish people were happy and excited to contribute. Hashem therefore gave them that opportunity. Bring out that characteristic that you all have the potential to show. You have it. You show that you have that for other things, for vanities. Use it for Kedusha. Because if you do so, it will make you a better person. And this is the Midah that we need to have in the generation of Mashiach as well. The rabbis tell us that what destroyed the temple was baseless hatred. What has to be rectified today is that we eliminate that baseless hatred. How do you eliminate baseless hatred? Ahavat chinam, selfless love. The exact opposite. Be kind to everyone. Be patient with everyone. Be tolerant of people's differences. Show that you care about everyone. Don't show any distance. Sinat chinam, baseless. What does it mean, baseless? You have no real reason to hate him. It's baseless, no, without any foundation. He's diff he thinks differently than you. He's more liberal. Okay, he may be wrong, but don't hate him. Don't, don't maintain a distance from him. Don't think you're better than him. He may have some qualities that are better than you. Give him the benefit of the doubt. There's so many ways where we can be more accepting of people instead of leaving that baseless hatred around. It is possible to rectify it. And that is why Hashem has given us the opportunity in this last generation before Mashiach to rectify it by being more charitable, by being more kind, by helping institutions and individuals with tzedakah. Hashem has made it happen. He has raised the standard of living before Mashiach comes in order to, for us to be able to fulfill that mitzvah. But we have to be careful because we're being challenged all the time. We may have had a hard day, we may not be in a good mood, and somebody knocks on your door, be careful, because that is our challenge, and that is our opportunity at the same time to bring Mashiach Sula. Amen. Sorry.